England, There England by A.G. MacDonald. Adapted in six parts by Bob Sinfield and narrated by Leslie Phillips. Episode 2. Last week, we learned how a young Scot called Donald Cameron, returning from service in the Great War, decided, nay, was encouraged by a publisher, no less, to write a book about the English, their traditional customs and curious habits. On the same day as this project commenced, Donald became the proud possessor of a job at the London Weekly under the editorship of the eccentric Mr Hodge, who, along with most of his staff, seemed to be chiefly occupied in playing cricket and drinking beer, though not as far as Donald knew, simultaneously. One morning, Donald entered the Dragon Hostelry at about quarter to twelve and discovered only one of Mr Hodge's circle leaning moodily against the counter. Recognising Donald, he offered... Have a drink. That's very kind. I'll have a half... Stinking fish. Pint of bitter. Sorry? God, this country smell. Pint of bitter. Uh, no, uh, a half pint of bitter. I make your mind up. A half pint of bitter! A half pint of bitter! Stinking fish! Is there no one here to serve a gentleman? You can't do that here, sir. Can't I, by God? Ah, well, maybe you can. Scum! Filthy, lousy, herring gutted, spavin bellied scum! Spavin? Spavin! A disease of horses, common in all fog-ridden, disgusting, beer-drinking countries. Never heard of it. Do you know nothing about horses? Well, I've done a good deal of farming. Then in God's name, let's talk about something else. Beer! Steward! Porter! Miss! Two-gallon mugs of your perfectly beastly beer. No gallon mugs, sir. What? All right, sir. Two pints. God, what a country. You can't get decent beer. You can't get decent food. You can't, you can't buy soft rose on toast after eight at night or hard rose on biscuits before noon. You can buy grated carrots beyond eleven, but not ones that are mashed, diced or pinched. What's a pinched carrot? A carrot that's been pinched, of course. Two pints. Oh, thank you. Eh, uh, here's... No, no, this is on me. Today's the anniversary of Roland's death in the Valley of Roncesvalles. We must drink to my fellow countrymen who saved Europe a thousand years ago and to the one who saved it in the Great War. You mean Sir John French? I mean Ferdinand Foch. Marshal of France. I beg your pardon, most profoundly. I had no idea. I mean, your English is so perfect. Can you really be a Frenchman? My family name is Hougain. There were Hougains in the Channel Islands long before Duke Robert of Normandy cast his eyes upon the Tanner's daughter. Well, no wonder you're proud of your descent. Oh, yes, especially when I think how the French nation met the power of Germany single-handed, resisted it. Drove it back, destroyed it. Single-handed? Practically. I mean, there was a Portuguese division somewhere to our left, but I can't recall any others. Well, there are some Belgians. What about the British Navy? Ah, yes. There were some ships. Donald's warm retort to this was fortunately never uttered, as just then Mr Hodge and a bevy of talented youth came pouring through the swing doors of the bar. As soon as he could, Donald asked Mr Hodge about this singular Frenchman. Him? He's no more French than I am. That's just his lunacy. But he said his family name was Hougar. <laughs> so it is, in a sense. It's Huggins. Ah. Tommy Huggins from Bolton. His great-granddad was the mayor once. But he sneered at the British Navy. Ah, that's a favourite pose of his. He was in the infantry, you know. Performed prodigies of valour. Donald went home thoughtfully. The problem his book presented him with was deeper and darker than he had at first imagined. Indeed, if Mr Huggins was a representative Englishman, the problem was utterly insoluble. 
After some hours of concentrated thinking, Donald concluded that he must dismiss the pseudo Channel Islander as a freak, and he made up his mind to see as little as possible of him in the future. But if Donald had finished with Mr. Huggins, Mr. Huggins had by no means finished with him. <laughs> Donald was due at Godalming Station at noon on Saturday to be motored thence to Ormerod Towers for his first taste of a typical English country weekend. Little after ten that morning, he was standing in his room in a state of some perplexity, for he didn't know what he was likely to need in addition to his evening clothes. While passing over each item of his scanty wardrobe, he heard a loud shouting in the street. Hell's eggs, but this is a lucky chance. I was roaring down the King's Road, pushing buses aside and stamping holes in the pavement when I saw a shop selling Corsican belly wash. Look! And with that, he raced up the two flights to the door of Donald's bedsit, producing a bottle of wine from each side pocket of a disreputable raincoat. Well, what are you hanging about for? Jump to it, lad. Jump to what? Fetch two glasses and a corkscrew. By the son of Austerlitz, what's going on in here? I've never seen so much haberdashery. <laughs> Fetching the necessary utensils, Donald explained his packing predicament. Mr. Huggins drained his first tumbler of Corsican belly wash and became portentously serious. It's a good thing for you that I'm here. I am probably the most expert advisor on weekend procedure between Staines and Burton on Trent. Others may tell you all sorts, but I will tell you right. Now, take Bill Hodge. <laughs> He goes to weekend parties in his football shirt, white flannels and pumps. <laughs> and on the Sunday morning, he sends the footman out to knock up the local chemist for a razor. <gasps> not right, Cameron, not right. No. Oh, yes, yes, I, I will have a little more. <laughs> <laughs> then... This Bobby Southcott, the boy novelist, takes a cold ham in case he gets hungry between meals and a book on birth control in case he gets... Oh, Huggins! Uh, are you all right? Cameron, be guided by me. The crux of the weekend is the servant. Do you follow? No. Get at the rich man's servant before he gets at you. Treat him rough and they're lovely. Treat them humble and they're hell. Attack, 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 as my famous fellow countrymen observed at the Battle of Waterloo Station. You can fool all the lackeys all the time. Well, good night, old man. Hmm? Uh, thank me another time. Good night. Huggins! You're oh. dribbling in my dress shirt. Huggins! You haven't told me what clothes to take. No. Uh. I will now recite that tear-jerking epic, The Dog That Took the Serum to Alaska. What? Clothes? <laughs> My dear chap, why didn't you ask me before? The solution is... Take them. But which ones? All of them. Everything you've got. Take one case and the butler sneers, the footman smirks, the under-house parlour mates have puppies. Take fifty, they treat you like the Duke of Westminster. Did you know that someone's been dribbling on your shirt? But I've only got... Yes, I did, thank you. I've only got two small cases. Besides, some of my stuff's so old, I couldn't possibly... Huggins was seized with demonic energy. He sank his third tumbler, routed out the two small cases, rushed from the house and roared at a passing taxi so that the windows shook. Ten minutes later, he returned with a dozen second-hand cases he bought at a shop in Sloan Square plus a bundle of enormous labels and a pot of red paint and proceeded to pack the Scotsman's entire belongings. All protests from Donald were overridden tempestuously. I can't take a pair of grey flannels with a hole in the knee. All right. What are you doing? There you are. Shorts for otter hunting. Put them in the otter hunting suitcase. Whichever is the otter hunting suitcase. The one you put the shorts in, of course. 
An old soccer outfit was packed with the description. Beagling kit. Battered bowler, two frayed dressing gowns, a broken brolly, odd shoes, even odder books, bits of rope and ornaments, dearly beloved by the landlady and her daughter Gladys, with a silent W, were all crammed into another case and labelled by Huggins. Amateur theatrica. One entire container filled with old newspapers, solemnly corded up, bore the legend in huge scarlet letters. Dispatches, secret. It proved impossible for Donald to escape this appalling accumulation of luggage by depositing it in the station cloakroom, for Mr. Huggins insisted on accompanying him as far as the platform, causing the poor boy agonies of embarrassment and confusion by hiring two porters to carry the dispatches secret, plus another pair for the remaining packages, and by addressing Donald deferentially but loudly at all times as Excellency. Nor were Donald's fears allayed by the last mysterious words of his self-appointed ally as the train steamed out. I'll fix that bloody butler. Trust me. A Rolls Royce met the train at Godalming, and Donald felt like bursting into tears as suitcase after suitcase emerged from the station. He was too miserable to notice the subtle increase of deference with which each piece of luggage was greeted by the chauffeur and footman. The station master himself attended to the dispatches secret, murmuring discreetly in Donald's ear, I was warned by telephone, my lord, from our head office. He was charmed as much by Donald's unassuming manner as by his half-crown. Just before it reached the front door of Ormerod Towers, the Rolls Royce loosed several melodious toots on the summery air, obviously a prearranged signal, and a half-dozen flunkies came tumbling down the broad steps, followed with great majesty by the butler, who sidled up to Donald respectfully. Uh, the secretary of the French Foreign Ministry rang, sir. Budapest has also been on the line. What? All of it? Donald was completely staggered by the news till he realised this was what his lunatic adviser had meant by fixing that bloody butler. But there was no denying that the madman's methods had so far secured much civility from normally proud menials. Lady Ormrod herself seemed delighted to see Donald, introducing him to a crowd of guests who all looked exactly alike before taking him aside for a moment. The Duke of Devonshire telephoned for you. You are on no account to ring him, but you must go to Chatsworth for luncheon on Monday. <laughs> she laid a beringed finger on her lips and nodded wisely, as if to convey that she too knew what was what. <laughs> As the afternoon was extremely wet, Donald had a heaven-sent opportunity for collecting material of the utmost value. And for a time at least, Mr. Huggins' diabolical phone calls were a definite help. For instance, an elderly man whose face seemed familiar approached our young friend with a bluff, jovial cry of... Oh, you're the boy I want to see! Oh. And led him off to a distant drawing room down many corridors, talking heartily as he went about greyhound racing. But as soon as he shut the door, his jolly manner changed into a confidential knowingness. Boy, you know me. Everybody does. That's my ticket. Now, can you tell me anything? Um, well, surely there's nothing I can tell you about anything. Ah, so nothing has moved since Tuesday? What do you mean by nothing? That's it. That's what I keep telling the blasted monkeys, but they won't see it. Can you beat it? Um, probably not. <clears throat> uh, will it go? Go? Go where? I see. Well, I never really thought it would. I won't deny I'm sick about it, but are we downhearted? That's my ticket.
Donald, completely bewildered, made his way back to the central hall where a rubber bridge had broken out and discovered, by means of some judicious eavesdropping, that the mysterious man was none other than Robert Bloomer, MP, a former TUC president and for 35 years Secretary of the Amalgamated Union of West End Journeymen Tailors, Cutters and Hemstitchers. He hastily jotted down his impressions of the great man, but was bound to admit he had no idea who the monkeys were, why they were blasted, and by whom. Barely had he begun to ponder this when a young lady of remarkable beauty and elegance glided towards the sofa on which he was perched and coiled herself down beside him. You are uh, Donald, aren't you? Yes. I've got a message for you. Ivan Novello has just telephoned from Hollywood to say he agrees with you, but you're to say nothing at the moment. Uh, is, uh, is that all he said? <laughs> well, you were expecting more. Well, I... I... Oh, look, I mustn't disturb you. You're obviously writing the plot for your next picture. You are a screenwriter. Not exactly. Oh, you're a film magnate. I adore film magnates. Esmeralda Davenor adored film magnates just as film girls adored her. Throughout the English-speaking world, it was she who had the most dazzling smile and the best publicity team. And here she was, snuggling down beside him, actually beside him, on the sofa. Donald was thrilled. Shy and modest though he was, he felt a warm glow steal over him at the flattering thought that this miracle of beauty had selected him to honour with her fragrant presence and her radiant smile. Until the reason dawned on him. Huggins. Blast that bloody man! Ignoring his exquisite companion, Don rose and strode out of the lounge into the rain. Esmeralda was intrigued. I wonder what he's got against Novello. The company sitting down to dinner are numbered 17, one chair being vacant. Lady Ormerod fretted hugely about the absentee. Oh, it's just like Rupert. Mm. Now I ask you, Bob, isn't it just like Rupert? No, I'm sure, no, I know. I never met him. Mm. Still, I expect he knows me. Everyone does. Mm. That's my... Ticket, yes. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> it was not until the Woodcock and the Nuit Saint-Georges were being served that the missing Rupert arrived. He was not in the least disconcerted at being late, nor by the glittering scene of cut crystal, diamonds, white waistcoats and cinematic loveliness, despite the fact that he was wearing a corduroy jacket, riding breeches and old army field boots. Rupert Harcourt was a poet and, as was clear to the entire assembled company, a drunken one. Their reactions were mixed. Lady Ormrod was delighted to see him while her husband, Sir Ethelred, appeared cold. Major General Fairbrother, veteran of many a Far East campaign, glared at the newcomer's costume, muttering. Reminds me of a basket case who tried getting into the Willingdon Club in Bombay. Oh, really? Sir Ethelred's niece, Patience, uttered what appeared to be the one adjective in her vocabulary. Grizzly. Ha! If I'm grizzly, will you be bear? <laughs> you get it? <laughs> Rupert, isn't that just like you? Reminds me of a bounder who mentioned a lady's name in the Bicolor Club, Bombay. I, I hear we're clearing out of India at last. What? Oh, yes. Well, of course, it hasn't been officially announced yet. But the Indian civil is being abolished, and no Englishman is to hold a higher army rank than colour sergeant. Mm. Good thing, too, I say. Oh, do you really? Esmeralda's mind was elsewhere. It was at that moment laying plans for vamping Donald into giving her the lead in his next film. Sir, the English are the finest governors in the world. 
It is our duty to go on governing. Well, if it comes to that, the, the Portuguese are good governors. So are the Egyptians. The Portuguese are damned bad governors. And as for the Egyptians, just as you like. After the ladies had left the table, Esmeralda, with ill-concealed reluctance, the talk returned to politics. Oh, I tell you, we're never going to get a really decent tariff instead of this fookling ten percent until we've drowned all those poisonous liberals. Bunch of barry traitors. Wish I'd had them in my company in the old days at Abbottabad. So what would you say? That this free trade stuff is what? Lunacy or criminal? Definitely criminal. <laughs> They're all in the pay at Moscow. Don't you think, Cameron? Well, I shouldn't think they actually accept money. Then what's your explanation, hmm? Um, it's... Well, it's just insanity, isn't it? You've got to be unhinged to believe we stand to gain by getting cheap wheat from Russia. A man who sees any sort of good in imports must be mad. Well, I hope you're right. I'd sooner have to deal with loonies than traitors. <laughs> but all the same, I myself heard a liberal say the other day that he would sooner see the people of this country pay a shilling a pound for Russian cocoa than three shillings a pound for cocoa from Sierra Leone. Oh, why Sierra Leone? Because Sierra Leone is in the empire, sir. Yes. And if that isn't either downright stark staring insanity or slow, cold-blooded treachery, I don't know what is. I'm a liberal. Exactly. Um, what? And I'm in favour of selling the Gold Coast to the United States as part payment of the war debt. Mm -hmm. And the Slave Coast, and the Pepper Coast, and the Salt Coast, and the Mustard Coast, and what, the what, Nutmeg what? Coast, and the Cinnamon oh, Coast, and the Vinegar oh, Coast, and the Olive Oil Coast, and Northern <laughs> Nigeria. And, oh, what's the other bit? And Southern Nigeria, and Old Uncle <laughs> Sierra Leone, and all. <laughs> and I would use the British fleet to coerce Japan into accepting Australia with all the Australians. Shall we join the ladies? The cigars were only a quarter smoked, the brandy had been round just once, but at all costs, bloodshed had to be averted. It was not turning into a very serene evening. Patience. Grizzly Ormrod, having learnt from the butler of Donald's gigantic film interests, backed him into a corner and subjected him to her entire theatrical curriculum vita. And then I played St. Joan in a pretty absolutely grisly production. Of what? St. Joan, of course, Ducky. <laughs> then I was Salome. That was pretty fulfilling. Really stretched me. But I won't ask what that was in. That was in Salome. <laughs> then I was Satania in the dream. The critics really raved, said they'd pretty much never seen anything like it. Where was this? Stratford? No, my school festival. Esmeralda looked on, furious. Bored to the point of insanity, she entertained thoughts of putting Patience across her knee and giving her a quick six with the back of a hairbrush. Mr Harcourt awoke with mysterious suddenness at 27 minutes past ten and stared round the room with an air of extreme puzzlement. Good God, I've forgotten where I am. You're in Ormerod Towers. Yes, I know that. What I mean is, I've forgotten what sort of a party it is. Are we up-to-date moderns mixing gin and beer and wallowing in T.S. Eliot? Or are we straight-living chaps who sing the Eton Boating Song a good deal? Or are we all just simple boys and girls darting in and out of each other's bedrooms? You're at an ordinary English weekend party, sir, and I'll thank you to... Come, remember. come, General. We want none of your barrack room licentiousness here. I shall sleep on the mat outside Esmeralda's door if this sort of thing's to be allowed. What the devil do you mean? I don't know what sort of chivalry they taught you at Sanders or Woolwich or sandwich, but to an old giggles wikian, a woman is sacred. Whatever for? Damned if I can remember. I never see the point of sneering at the public school system. It is the breeding ground of great men. Yes, mm. those privately educated oiks are a pretty grisly set of oiks. Grocer's sons and oiks and whatnot. My father was a grocer. 
Why am I not surprised to hear that? But, Rupert, I thought all your family were soldiers. Mm, only the ones not clever enough to be grocers. <laughs> <laughs> well, darlings, I'm going to bed. I wish someone would tell me if this is the sort of party where I offer to come with you. <laughs> really, Rupert, I won't allow you to say such things. <laughs> no, but the point is, will Esmeralda? Uh. <laughs> Good night, everyone, including Rupert. One by one, the house party went to bed. The lights were extinguished by a tired-looking footman. Fires were raked out, the shutters bolted, the windows locked. Another Saturday was finished. Another typical weekend at Ormerod Towers had been successfully launched. Sunday was just the same as Saturday had been, and Donald went back to Chelsea on Monday morning with a book full of notes. Mr Harcourt travelled up in the same carriage. Before reaching London, he'd made great havoc with a pint flask of neat whisky. Next week, we find the two of them taking part in another English weekend pursuit, the village cricket match, under the captaincy of Mr Hodge, that dispenser of sound tactical advice such as... Play carefully, keep your end up, runs don't matter. And we meet an American gentleman, Mr Shakespeare Pollock, in a state of some confusion as to the nature of the game. I thought I was playing baseball. Baseball? Isn't that a kind of rounders? Join us, then. Part two of England, There, England by A.G. MacDonnell was adapted by Bob Sinfield and narrated by Leslie Phillips. With Sam Graham as Donald Cameron, Peter Kelly as Huggins, Denise Coffey as Lady Ormerod, Christopher Benjamin as Bloomer, Katie Odie as Esmeralda, and Robin Bailey as the Major General. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Technical presentation was by Graham Harper, Kevin Oliver and Vicky Carter. The director was Neil Cargill. England There England is a Splice of Life production for BBC Radio 2.